Good evening. So lovely to have you all here with us this evening. Um, my name is Luke Hart. I'm head of strength conditioning here at the Sports Surgery Clinic. I also run our fitness services and our golf lab services as well. And tonight what I'm going to talk about is how strength conditioning can really impact your health, but also your golf performance as well. And linking the two together and linking in with what David is talking about in terms of how we can use strength conditioning to minimize your injury uh, history and the amount of injuries that you get. And so what we're going to go through tonight is why you should include some strength conditioning in your plan, how that can hopefully minimize your injuries and keep you on the course for longer, but also touch on how that can improve your golf performance as well, include improving your distance and your club head speed as well, and the ways that you can go about doing that. Okay. So first bit that I want to go through is the misconception that this is just for young people and this is just for people that want to hit the ball really far. More and more, we're seeing everybody of all demographics and all walks of life are being able to hit the ball a little bit further. But more importantly, strength and conditioning is for everybody. It is a massively healthy activity and really, really helps you um, maintain that muscle mass and maintain what you love for longer. So that was the first bit. I just wanted to put that out there because often people look at some of the videos that we pop up today and think, geez, I can never do that. And actually, sometimes a lot of the clients that we have with inside six months even are actually doing some of what you'll see on the videos today. And we've had people, uh, male, female, 60, 70, all doing some of the videos that you're going to see tonight. Okay. And hopefully then I'm also going to talk to you about why being strong is so good for you in the long term. And so we know that the World Health Association really thinks this is something we should be doing. They advocate for everybody to be doing two strength and conditioning sessions a week. And on top of that, they also say that we should be doing about 150 minutes of low intensity activity. Well, the good thing for everyone who plays golf is pretty much all of us should get that at least once in a week. But when the nights are like they are at the moment and it's a little bit dark out, you might want to think about adding a second session in, and that might be your strength conditioning session. It could also be a bike. It could also be a long walk, but just something maybe in the middle of the week, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, away from the weekend when generally we have our competitions and we're out on the golf course that you could do just to keep your physical activity up or maybe, you know, keep that strength up and, you know, minimize the, the chances of joint pain, back pain, uh, and especially any kind of bone stress issues as well. And so it's a massively healthy activity that we want to do. So why is it important? Well, David's going to talk about this this evening as well, in terms of the fact that with golfers, up to 50% of people will experience some form of lower back pain within the season, you know, uh, each year. About 25% will experience some form of elbow and wrist pain, and up to 20% will have some form of knee pain. And generally with golf, most people don't stop golf because they don't enjoy it anymore. You know, it's generally a lifelong sport. We love it uh, as for as long as we can play. And so it's generally injuries that stop us from playing. It's not any other reason. And so if we can minimize the risk of injury, then really hopefully we can keep you playing golf for as long as you want to play golf and playing to the level and the performance you want to as best as possible. And so... Then it comes to, well, why is strength important? And I get this question all of the time. Well, what we can see here is on the left-hand side, we can see the muscle in the dark color. And then we can see the kind of fat mass around that on the top left there of your screens, okay? On the right, we can see an 80-year-old woman's, and we can see that the, the fat mass has increased and the quality of that muscle, that the uh, white running through the muscle has increased as well. And if we look at the graph just below, we can see around the ages of kind of 40 to 50, we see that steep drop off in our muscle uh, strength and muscle quality. And so the big thing here is this is completely preventable. And generally what we see is without us doing any work, we see about a 3% decline in our muscle strength year on year after uh, the age of 50. But as you can see on the right hand side, we can absolutely do something about this. So we can see in the top picture on the right hand side, a 40-year-old triathlete has that brilliant muscle quality. You can see that dark color there in the muscle with very thin amount of fat around the outside. And if we don't do anything, we can see what it might look like when we're 74. So we can see that the fat mass has increased and the white running through the muscle has increased as well. But then the good news is, is as we can see at the bottom, is that as a 70-year-old, we can see that actually it's completely preventable. And actually by doing some strength conditioning and some aerobic work, we can maintain a lovely amount of muscle, as you can see in that bottom picture, with a very small amount of fat mass there. And that really is what all of us want to try and achieve. Okay, If we can do that, we see some massive improvements in our life expectancy, but also the amount of sport that we can play, 
and the amount of physical activity and also um, how long we can be kind of self-serving ourselves as well. So it's, it's brilliant to be able to, to kind of maintain those muscle mass levels. And so then the next question I get is, well, how do we do that? What's the best way? Is it yoga? Is it Pilates? Is it cycling or running? Well, the, the answer is really a bit of a mixture. So what we can see from this study that was conducted is that strength and endurance together gave the best results in lower limb strength and in upper limb strength and muscle mass. So having some strength exercises, but also some endurance exercises during the week had better results than even strength training alone or endurance training alone. And so for us that play golf, we're already getting our endurance really mostly from the stuff that we do on the course. So really the only thing that we probably need to add in a little bit more of is maybe that strength training. And maybe in the winter time, if we're only getting out once a week, and maybe sometimes only even for nine holes, is maybe a little bit of endurance, maybe in the mid portion of the week. So whether that's a walk, a cycle, a run, you know, something of that nature would be very, very helpful. And so the first things that we lose as we get older are strength and power. So it makes sense that they're really the things we want to focus on. They're the bits, the, the key qualities that we want to try and keep for as long as possible. Okay. And so I've got a little bit of a challenge for you tonight. Okay. So there's a brilliant relationship between leg extension power. That's essentially your, your thigh muscles. Okay. Um, so the muscles in front of your leg and how many sit to stands that you can do in 30 seconds. Okay. And there's a really good association. The more you can do, the better the muscle mass. And I've got the results that you should be aiming for in the next slide. But first off, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to, hopefully in the chair that you're sitting on at home, I want you to take, move the chair a half um, foot back. And what I'm going to get you to do is I'm going to pop a video on the screen for 30 seconds. And I'm going to get you now to try and stand up as many times as you can in 30 seconds, sit all the way back down again and stand up again. Okay. And naturally this is for anyone who hasn't got any knee or, or lower back pain. So just what I want you to do, slide the chairs back now. And what I'd like you to do is put your hands out in front of you if you can, so you can't use your hands on your legs, okay? And if you get yourselves ready, and what I'd like you to do is when the video starts playing, when you start to hear the music, I want you to go for as many as you can, okay? Inside 30 seconds, okay? So if you get yourselves ready. Well done. So just have a little breather for a second after doing that. Okay. And so we have our results here. So just whilst you're having a breather, um, what we can see is that if you've got 22, you've done really well. You're in that nice green category. You've got a good level of strength. Now, I'll show you later that maybe that's, that's really good for just general health. For golf, we wouldn't even mind you pushing that up a little bit. 15, you're in that amber kind of zone. Okay. So we probably want to get you doing some strength conditioning work. And if we're on 11, then we definitely want to help you along and definitely get those legs a little bit stronger if we can. OK, so hopefully you've all done well there. But it's a really nice test and it is an easy test to do. And it is just a baseline level test, but it gives us a good indication of whether we maybe need to do a little bit more in that strength work. And I would say definitely if we're only just getting the 22, uh, we could definitely help you push that on a little bit more, especially to help your golf as well. And so then how strong is strong enough? And that's the, the question we get asked all the time, okay? And so we have a couple of um, kind of bits here that we, we would kind of present. And a lot of people think, you know, these are really hard, but actually we tend to see people achieve these within inside six to 12 months, regardless of age, really, okay? And so on the left, we can see is your leg kind of uh, strength that we want to achieve. And that's a front squat, if you're, if you're happy to squat between 50 and 75% of your body weight or a wall hold, four lots of one minute, holding against the wall at 90 degrees, um, kind of flat against the wall, or a leg press of 1.5 to two times body weight. Okay, and you only have to achieve one of them, you know, we're not asking you to achieve all three. For your posterior chain, and that's the muscles at the back of your body, so such as your lower back, your bum, and your hamstrings, we look at a deadlift of one times your body weight, or a hip thrust to one to 1.5 times your body weight. And then for the upper body, now the upper body is really important in golf. And it's especially important as we age 
and, and for females, I think this is really important for bone mineral density, is eight to 10 push-ups. Okay, now that can be any version. It could be flat or it could be on an incline. Uh, one to three pull-ups, which is pretty tricky to be honest with you, or pulling 30 to 40% of your body weight on a cable machine. Um, so like the ones you have in the gym where you would, you would attach onto the cable and then you can pull a single arm. Okay, and so they're the targets that we should aim for. But, you know, that can take time and that might take six to 12 months of someone uh, working with us for them to achieve that. And so with strength, it's really, really important for our health, because what we find is that generally, if you're strong, you have a better life expectancy than if you're slightly weaker. And studies have shown that if you're strong and you have a slightly higher BMI, you still actually have a slightly better uh, life expectancy than maybe someone who's weaker but has a lower BMI. OK, so when all things are equal, being strong is actually very, very healthy for you, even if you have a slightly higher BMI versus maybe someone who is uh, has a slightly lower BMI, but actually isn't as weak. So for everything else being equal, being stronger is definitely going to have a better life expectancy, but also it's going to have big impacts on how active you can be throughout your years as well. So it's really, really important. So then. What relates kind of the strength back to club head speed? Well, what we found is in the studies uh, in, in professional golfers is that the stronger you are, the better your club head speed. And if we can improve your strength by 10 or 20%, we see a good correlation of about 5 to 10% in your club head speed. Now, a lot of people say, well, geez, Luke, what does that mean? Well, about a 10% improvement in your club head speed could be up to 20 yards. So it really is that difference between maybe taking a five iron into the green or taking an eight iron into the green. And in some cases, you might even get 30 or 40 yard improvements um, with inside kind of eight to 12 weeks. And so it really is quite a big difference that you'll see. And it really help, can help you bring come down kind of two club lengths um, if you really commit to it. So it really can help improve your game, especially your five iron performance and your driver performance as well. And so we know that club head speed is linked to your handicap. So the faster your club head speed, generally the lower handicap you'll have. We see long game uh, performance improves, okay? And your distance will definitely obviously improve both your carry and um, your run as well. But it's really important that once we get you strong, we do have to do a little bit of transfer work. And I, I'm gonna show you some videos of that tonight of the different ways you can kind of transfer this. Once you, ha you have strength, you can transfer it into your, your swing. And so also, when we uh, strike the ball with a the driver, there's massively high forces. It's, it's similar to that of throwing a javelin, actually, believe it or not. And so having that level of strength actually protects you against injuries when you're using the driver. And this young man on the right-hand side here, he's got about 133 uh, miles per hour club head speed, can probably strike the ball into the, to the mid uh, to low 300 yard kind of range. As you can see there. Um, but to do that, we have to have a certain amount of strength. And so this is a really nice infographic, and this is of uh, higher level golfers, so handicaps five to scratch. And what we can see here is actually 60 plus year olds can actually really hold a very good level of club head speed. So what we can see, if we look at the, the 70th percentile and the 50th, 50th percentile there in the middle, we can see that actually a 60-year-old golfer can have the same club head speed as a 16-year-old golfer and, you know, can actually have a pretty high level. And if we can maintain, you know, a 90 to 100 uh, miles per hour club head speed, that is phenomenal. You know, you're really, going to really get some good distance. So it really is to dispel the myth that, you know, we can't hold on to this in our 50s, 60s or even 40s, um, which is what I hear on the weekend every now and again. So definitely this is an area that we can all be working on and, and make big strides to improve. So then coming on to this next is how do we go about doing it? Well, first off, we have to improve our strength levels. Okay, so we need to improve our maximum strength first, and then we need to transfer that down the chain. So what we need, then need to do is we need to do some slightly faster work to apply that. So it's a little bit like a car. We can have a really big engine, but if we don't tune the car up, you know, that big engine probably isn't going to give us the speed that we, we need. Okay, so we want to start off with some strength work. Then we're going to do some explosive work. And then we might do some swing speed training uh, and some over speed training with some clubs as well. And then hopefully we see a nice 10 up to 20% improvement in club head speed, which again, like I say, could result in up to kind of 
40 yards extra on our, on our driving distance and our hitting distance. And so we have a continuum that we use here at the clinic and it goes from high force on the left-hand side to, to high velocity on the right-hand side. Okay, and I've got a few videos here to show you. So these are just some of the clips of our training here. Okay, and what we have first is an example of a high force one. This is where the bar isn't moving at all. Okay, so we're pulling up into the bar and nothing is moving. And this is really good for any injured populations, especially uh, knee and hip pain, because that bar isn't moving. Essentially, the joint isn't moving and therefore we can get a really good strength gain without, you know, the creaking knees or the hips giving you any kind of issues at all. And also that's a brilliant exercise for actually protecting the lower back as well. And that's one of our high force exercises that we do. You know, we do that with a lot of our uh, injured populations as well. Then you can see one of my colleagues here. He's doing some deadlifts here. Now, whilst he's deadlifting here, I have to say that actually we have a lot of people in their 40s, 50s and 60s deadlifting a very similar weight uh, to my colleague here. Um, but this would be another way of just strengthening your posterior chain, your hamstrings, your backside and your lower back there. And it's very, very healthy for you. Now, obviously, you do have to start off light and gradually increase, but it's an excellent way of really increasing your strength. We also then have some of our leg strength exercises as well, which we start off. And this is just holding a dumbbell, sitting back on the box. We can all do this. You know, you can even do this in your chairs at home, you know, adding a little bit of extra load uh, as well in the hands. So you're really working the core as well on this and getting that good leg strength as well. And then we move into a little bit of power work. Now, I'm not expecting everyone to do this, okay? But it's just an example of what we can do. But also for those who really want to try and push their club head speed, some examples of the different types of training that you want to do to really try and get that power into the lower limb. And again, this is one of our, my colleagues here doing some power work with a little bit of extra load as well uh, onto the other side. So then it brings us on to our swing speed progressions. Okay. So once we have the prerequisite strength and we want to try and improve our actual speed of our swing, there's a couple of different progressions that we use that you can actually do down the range as well. Now, in this video, we're using a swing speed stick that actually helps us, uh, gives us a little bit more speed in our swing, but actually using um, different clubs. So you can actually use your lighter clubs, such as your uh, pitching wedge, or heavier clubs as well, such as your five iron to do this with. OK, um, what we're focusing on is we're not actually focusing on hitting the ball here. We're just focusing on swinging as fast as we can. OK, so it's far removed from actually hitting practice on the range. OK, so the first example we have is just simply where we're trying to swing as fast as possible. OK. And we're just trying to get all of our weight behind the ball and all you care about is trying to swing as best as you can. Secondly, then we have what we call the one step swing. Now, this can also be called the Happy Gilmore as well. Uh, for anybody who's watched Happy Gilmore, you'll definitely recognize this one. It's where you take a big step in, and that really helps you get a little bit of extra power. And I definitely wouldn't advise this on the tee box, that's for sure. But it's a great way for you to try and develop a little bit of extra power. And then we have the counter swings. Okay, now this is where you swing the golf clubs both ways, and it's very strange to start with, but we see some excellent improvements in club head speed by using this. So swinging both directions, and it really helps you use your hips more on this one, which is excellent, okay? And so there are three ways and three swing speed progressions that you could utilize in your training to maybe help you get that little bit of extra speed, but also act as a fantastic warm up as well if you're on the range. So that then brings us on to our golf lab. And so over the years, we've obviously done a lot with a lot of our golfers in and around Ireland, and we wanted to make a specific service for people who want to try and improve their golf or want to try and minimize their risk of injury. And so we've created the golf lab. And within the golf lab, we have a number of different tests to, to kind of help you. So what we have is we have some total body strength and power testing, um, where we test your total body strength, uh, similar to what we saw in the video earlier of my colleague, lifting the bar into an immovable weight, okay? Very, very safe. We also do some jump testing as well to see how much power you have, both double leg and single leg. And that's really interesting because we know that both your dominant and your non-dominant leg both have a, a really big impact on how fast you can swing the club. And then we have what's called some isokinetic strength testing. Now, what we do on this bit is we test the strength of your glutes, basically your, your backside muscles. 
because the stronger you are through them, the better we can protect your lower back, but also the more powerful you can be. So it's a really big one for us um, in terms of our, our kind of lower back risk and making sure people don't have lower back injuries. We also have some swing speed testing, okay? And the idea there is that we can take a baseline and then compare that as you go through the program. So what we can see is over every four weeks, if you're in the program, you can then retest your swing speed and see, am I getting a little bit faster? And then obviously a personalized strength conditioning program based off the results and what you want to achieve, okay? And that's really important because for some people, you might want to achieve you know, maximum speed, whereas others you know, might have had a couple of injuries, may have come from a knee replacement or a back surgery, and just want to really make sure that they're really robust and making sure that they can stay playing golf for as long as possible. So everything is absolutely individualized to you. And all of the testing is individualized to you. So all of these tests have a range that we can take you through from easy to hard. So it's all personalized from you from the start to the finish. Okay. And the price on that is 150 euros. So if you're interested in that, we have contact details at the end of the presentation. And so what we try and include is one component of each of these three areas some lower limb strength and power, some rotational strength. We know that's really important in golf. You know, you've got to have good core strength. You've got to be able to rotate. You've got to have the range of motion as well. And then some injury prevention as well. And we always make sure as well that you've got as much kind of range of motion as possible because that's really important. You can have all the strength in the world, but if we don't have the range to get that rotation on our swing, then, you know, we can't really access that strength that we've built up. We also have our total tee box warm up, and we'll have a link to this uh, after afterwards that you can see all the videos um, for the total tee box warm up. But it is really, really important because you know a lot of us, myself included, just rock up to that first tee without having done a warm up. But actually, you know, we can get up to an extra twenty percent distance by just doing a warm up, and hopefully um, prevent that bogey or double bogey on the first hole as best as possible as well. And so that'll be in the the kind of links for the show. Uh, to this evening and you can have a look at all of those videos as well we also have a sample strength conditioning plan um, that we can give to you and it's on our website currently and i have a few videos to show you all of the exercises but this is a brilliant program if you just want to get started by yourself and you feel really confident uh, that you're happy with these exercises then please feel free to start and it's a brilliant six-week program that you can do you can record your loads as to the amount that you lift maybe have a down week on week seven, and then you can always start the program again, okay? And if you get to the point, you know, where you think, you know, you've kind of advanced as best you can through this program, that's when you can always come see us or another qualified professional, uh, you know, for a, a bit more of a specific program for you, okay? And what this program entails is we have some strength work. So for example, my colleague here doing some trap bar deadlift, okay, really safe exercise. And we're looking at the hips back, a nice flat back and shoulders over toes. Um, here he's lifting 30 kilos, okay? So this is what we'd aim for people to be lifting within kind of side six to eight weeks, to be honest with you, once they have the technique. But then we also have all of the other exercises that are on the program as well, okay? So we have goblet squats, where we're sitting to stand like we've done this evening, okay? The trap bar deadlift as well that we've just been through. The wall squat hold, whereby you're holding against the wall at 90 degrees. Uh, you'll have seen this on Island's Fittest Family if you've watched that at all. And you want to try and hold for 30 to 45 seconds at the start, building up to one minute eventually. And you want to try and have a vertical shin if you can. And what we mean by that is making sure that your knee doesn't come over your toe. Okay. We also have the split squat there in the bottom left. This is brilliant at build, building up single leg strength. So if you've had any knee issues in the past, such as an ACL, or even in uh, some places you've had small amounts of clean out operations, maybe with your surgeon, that would be a brilliant one to get the strength back. And then we're looking at really protecting the lower back with the hip thrust, you know, using those backside muscles and really strengthening them as best as we can. And your backside is one of the strongest muscles in your body. So it's really one that we want to make sure is as strong as possible. Unfortunately, though, for a lot of us in office based jobs, we sit on our backsides all day, so we don't really use them as best as we should. So a hip thrust is a brilliant option for many of us and really helps alleviate back pain, but also really improves performance. And then we want to relate it back to our swing and getting some rotational core work in there as well. It's really, really important. Um, and this one, you just want to make sure you're kind of in your seven iron position, you know, so your typical seven iron kind of posture, and then you're going to rotate the band from there. So small bend in the knees as if you're approaching a seven iron. And all of these videos you can get on our website. 
So you'll have all the videos there as well and the program uh, also to kind of go along with that. So a few takeaway thoughts from this evening, okay? Take it slow, gradually introduce exercises. You don't need to introduce all of them and then gradually improve them. So increase the weight, the reps or the sets when it gets too easy. So we want to progressively overload the body and we want to make sure that you're always finding it a little bit challenging. And when you finish a session, you want to have at least a seven out of 10 effort. So if 10 is really hard effort, you know, um, at the end of a run, maybe one is, you, you know, you're just getting out of bed. You want it to be a six or a seven. Okay. And consistency is key. So doing well over one year, is going to give you much better results in terms of your muscle mass, in terms of your swing speed, and in terms of your injury prevention than doing three perfect months. So doing a little bit over the course of one to two to three years, we know it's healthy for, for our whole lives, is much better than you know, being perfect for a six or eight week program. We see a lot of people telling you know, six to 10 week programs and then we drop off after that. Well, actually, if we can get some consistency and make it a bit more habitual, then that's much better. And again, I think you know, now is the perfect time to start when it's dark outside, we can't get out on the course in the, in the evenings. You know, it's a really great way to, to get a little bit of strength in now. It can really help our handicap and our performance in the competitions uh, in the summer. And also the last one is that strong equals help being healthy. We know that for all things being equal, if you are stronger, you probably have a better life expectancy and generally you're going to have less issues than if we're slightly weaker, all other things being equal. And so, you know, it's really good, A, for our swing speed, B, for our injury prevention, but massively it's really important just for, for us and in general health. Lastly, for those of you that do have um, health insurance with Irish Life, Fit, and Layer, we also have the fitness lab. And the fitness lab is actually included in a lot of the, the health plans. And if, within the fitness lab, we can actually make it specific to you. So if you wanted golf lab and you wanted some of those assessments, that's easily done and included in the fitness lab. And it's actually all, a lot of it is covered for you by your health insurance. Um, sometimes it's part covered and sometimes it's fully covered. So just to have a little look in your policy documents and see whether you have that there available for you, because it's an absolutely brilliant way to make a great start into improving your strength and conditioning, improving your fitness, you know, making sure you're, you're fully healthy. You know, you'll meet with one of our uh, physicians, our doctors, or with myself as well for the, the, the fitness lab testing as well. So hopefully that's given you some insight into why we think strength conditioning is so important for, for golfers and hopefully convinced you to do a little bit more. And I'll be more than happy to take any questions about anything that we've presented there this evening. And if you have any questions, feel free to email into us you know, we can send over the programs, we can send over any of the resources I've presented tonight. So hopefully that helps you and hopefully uh, helps your golf more importantly. Thanks very much. I know. Thanks for a really excellent talk. Um, and I just want to remind people that if they're worried about the exercises, they didn't catch them and the same for the next talk. Um, this will all be up on the website and we all will send you another link to it as well. And if you know anyone that's interested, you can redirect them to our website. So don't worry if you didn't catch anything this time. Right, look, we have a lot of questions and we're probably not gonna get through everybody's, but we'll try most of them. So Betty's asking, are there exercises you would recommend to strengthen the knee to prevent pain when she's walking down the hill? Yeah, absolutely. So some of the exercises that we went through on the videos there would be excellent. Um, the wall hold especially is very good uh, because there's not much movement associated with it, but you get a brilliant strengthening of, of the muscles around the knee. So that would probably be my first go-to exercise because it's very unlikely to cause you any discomfort, but it really does give you an excellent amount of uh, strength in the muscles surrounding the knee. So uh, a lot of the exercises in the videos there would, would be perfect, but either uh, uh, the wall sit that we had in there or maybe a step up at the bottom of the stairs would be brilliant to try and build up those muscles um, for sure. Okay, good. Uh, Rosemary, um, she's saying, can you give her advice how to cope with slight swelling that develops under the sole of the foot during when she's playing golf? Now, she's said she's right-handed. I don't know if that makes a difference, but any ideas on that one? Yeah, so there is um, some fascia underneath the foot that can get swollen if you, if you load it too much. Yeah. Um, so it would kind of be a telltale sign that it's happening when, when walking. Um, so it could be plantar fascia. It could be there's... Um, 
some fat pads and some bursts underneath there that could be getting inflamed. So really you would want to have a look at an assessment to see why that's happening. It might be that you just need to strengthen around the foot to try and provide that with a little bit of support, or you may need some physio or maybe help from one of our, our sports physicians. So definitely I would get an assessment to have a look at it, especially if it's consistently happening um, every time you're walking, definitely. Okay, Tony's just actually asked um, if and if somebody wants to make an appointment, do they need a GP referral? No, so you don't need a GP referral for the sports uh, medicine section. Uh, so to see physio, our sports medicine physicians or strength condition, you don't need a referral. But if you were going to see one of our consultants and our surgeons, you would need a GP referral. Yeah, so it's really more the surgeon side um, but rather than the sports medicine side. Okay, Fran, uh, would biomechanical analysis of your swing be of help to modify stress on the knee? Potentially, yes. I think definitely um, seeing a, a golf instructor to, to make sure your swing um, is as efficient as it can be for you. Obviously, everyone has a different swing. It is never going to be a bad thing for you. However, definitely there's a certain amount in golf which you can't avoid loading, which is the walking of the course. Um, you know, so you can't really avoid that component. So that's where the strengthening is going to be really important. You need to give it that base level of strength. Um, but absolutely having a look at the biomechanics of your swing and making sure you're not putting stress in other areas of the body you shouldn't be putting on. It's definitely going to help. But usually we see the knee issues come from, you know, the general walking of the course as opposed to the actual swing itself. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rosie, she has, uh, she has wrist tendonitis in both wrists. Are there exercises she can do to strengthen her wrist when she's playing golf? Absolutely. So this is one that we see very commonly. So, um, it generally happens when your, your golfing goes up quite a large amount. So generally in the summer months, we see it because we don't play as much in the winter and then we get this big flood. So uh, in the summer, when the weather gets better, especially if we go on like a golfing holiday or we play, we have a week off or maybe we play a couple of rounds. So there's absolutely exercises that you can do. Um, there's wrist and forearm exercises, so wrist extensions and wrist flexion exercises um, are brilliant. And you want to start off very light on the weight. Um, a physio or us at the clinic should be able to guide you through that because you do want to have progression of those exercises slowly uh, over time and make sure there's no pain when you're doing them. But there's definitely exercises that you can be doing to strengthen the forearm muscles that will then affect the tendons as well. Okay, lovely. Uh, Mike says, are there any special strength and condition exercises for golf after a total knee replacement? So the big thing after a total knee replacement is you get the strength back into the leg. So what tends to happen is after a total knee replacement, we do see a lot of muscle wastage around the knee and we have to try and get that back before heading back out onto the golf course or at least before maybe going back to 18 holes. So absolutely, you want to do all of your normal rehab that you do for a total knee replacement, but make sure that those the, the muscles around that knee are as strong as possible before heading back to golf. There's no specific exercises for a total knee replacement. You know, there's lots of options available to you. It's just what suits you best, what causes that pain, uh, that knee as little pain as possible. And then from there, just progressing it to make sure it's the same strength as the other leg or as close as possible. Uh, and that will then transfer into golf, no problems at all. Okay, good. Uh, uh, Joe, he had a right hip replacement in 2019, still got a bit of pain in the muscles and has trouble now with his right knee because he's osteoarthritis, um, meniscus deprived yeah. in the past. Are most of the exercises you, you showed tonight, are they suitable for him? Absolutely. So they would be suitable. Obviously, everyone's got their own individual uh, areas they need to work on and after an injury history there probably are workarounds that we might need to look at so that might be a perfect example of where we might use a bit more of a personalized approach rather than the the kind of um program that we have there those exercises will all be uh, suitable for you it's just a case of if there's certain regions or certain movements you struggle to get into we might you know adjust them for you to raise the heights maybe that you do certain them certain ones from or we might even raise you know if we were doing some form of squat or step up we might kind of do it off a lower level, depending on what your range of motion is like. But absolutely all of them will be uh, suitable for you. It's just adjusting them and personalizing them for you is what I'd say is really the important component to that. Okay, lovely. Um, Alana, is a good warm up important to play better from the start of your round? Often it takes three to four holes to, set to get going. Yeah, that's a brilliant question. So it's absolutely uh, vital, really that you, you do it not only just from, from an injury perspective, but like you said there, from a performance perspective. So the evidence is you can kind of get up to 10 or 15% power improvements if you do a good warm up, but also just in terms of your scoring over the first four holes, you will do better if you do a warm up. So I think we've all been there where we've rushed onto that first tee and the first two holes are a complete write off. And then you kind of sit there and you're trying to dig yourself out of it. But if we can get warm up time, then that's really important. Now, the first thing I would do is, 
try and get your range of motion because if we're jumping out of the car after a long day at work, you know, we're not going to be able to rotate the same that we do kind of four or five holes. So getting your rotation and doing some movement and some swings is the most important. But if you have time, a few squats on the T-box, like we said there, the total T-box warm-up, we have the videos online for you, um, would be brilliant. So just there's a few exercises you can literally do on the first tee. You don't necessarily need to go to the driving range or to the nets, but I think it's absolutely vital. You try and give yourself at least five minutes just to, to get a few swings and get that rotation uh, if you can. Yeah, lovely. Thanks, Luke. Okay, um, James said, um, he, Luke, he says he has, if I have a bad swing, I get a sharp pain in my left hip, no pain after a good swing. Can you recommend any exercises? So dependent on the, the swing and dependent on the club that you're using as well, I mean, it might be that um, on the ones where you're getting pain, uh, there could be a compensation. So you could be moving away from the ball or putting more pressure on that lead leg. So it sounds like when you're utilizing that leg a little bit more, you could be getting pain again without having a look at your swing or seeing what you're doing. That would be pretty tricky. But definitely um, there'd be some exercises to probably help you, but we have to see the underlying reason of that. So um, it could be that we just need to strengthen around your, your lateral hip. You know, a lot of the time we sway back in our golf swing and that causes us a little bit of an issue. Um, but it would definitely be something we need to look at and, and probably uh, do an assessment on to see why that might be uh, causing you some difficulty and some pinching. Yeah. Uh, someone just said she was watching the video and she said, on the wall hug, it states, could you just tell her again where should her knee be in relation to her ankle? Yeah, so if you're doing the wall hold, your, your knee in relation to your ankle should be literally straight up. So your knee should be facing towards the ceiling. What you don't want is your knee going over the top of your toes. So that's yeah. probably an easier way to think about it. You want your knee in line with your ankle. You don't want your knee over the top of your toes. So essentially what you should be able to do is you should be able to see your shoelaces at all times when you do that exercise. So you could, should be able to see your toes the whole time. Lovely. Listen, Luke, that was great. Thanks very much. If we have some more questions for you, we'll, we'll email them over to you and, uh, and you can answer them.